so as you have seen quite a few Kimpin graphics card models on my channel this far like RTX 2080 Ti Kimpin, the 3090 Kimpin, now the latest one has been the RTX 3090 Ti Kimpin, a lot of overclocking content related to those graphics card models and also GPU lapping content, I thought about showing you guys in a very close look the very original Kimpin graphics card model that was ever released to the market by EVGA. So the one you can see in front of the camera right now is the GeForce GDX 780 Ti classified Kimpin. So this is the very original Kimpin graphics card model and uh, I do consider it as one of the most legendary graphics cards that were ever released to the market in the history of like PC components and overclocking. Even Kimpin himself has said that this is probably his favorite graphics card of all time and it has been a lot of fun and joy to be part of this whole uh, graphics card project. You can easily note this card from other like 780 Ti models and also from like newer graphics card models from the clear shroud. It's definitely something unique, it's co it looks completely different than how uh, other 780 Ti models looked back in the day and even compared to newer like uh, classified and Kimping graphics cards from EVGA. I think this card came out during the earliest days of 2014. Some of the software for this card, especially the EVBOT firmware, was already dated at uh, late moments of 2013, but I think it was released like officially during the early parts of 2014. You may have seen this card on some videos from CES of 2014 or Computex of 2014. I think the price range of this card back in the day was somewhere around like 600 or 700 euros. I can't remember like correctly. It did feel quite expensive back in the day, but compared to the prices of the most modern high-end graphics cards, it's definitely cheap. Nowadays the prices are just completely ridiculous, but even back in, back in the day it did feel quite expensive and imagine you could run up to four of these cards in SLI. So four-way SLI with four 780 Ti classified Kimpins. Nowadays the multi-GPU configurations are restricted to two-way SLI only, but people usually just run single graphics card nowadays. Yeah, I thought about showing you guys this uh, card like together, like in a very close look. I managed to get this card from Chispy, who's yet another member on HWP forums. The price was somewhere around like $200. It did feel quite expensive for a graphics card of this age. But considering uh, its collection value, I think uh, you can't really find this particular uh, graphics card model for that cheap, unless you are extremely lucky at some uh, PC components like recycling place or whatever. So yeah, so uh, it's a two slot graphics card model so it doesn't extend from uh, two PC Express slots but it's quite a bit taller than the standard size of uh, PC Express slot graphics cards, whatever. Two fans, I think these are 80 or 90 millimeter fans and uh, yeah, the main color scheme is this uh, clear shroud around the cooling fans and the uh, uh, cooling fins that you can see through the fans over there and the cooling plates for the memory chips as well as the VRM are colored red or however. Let's look at the back side and I will put all of the necessary uh, like uh, software as download links in the description box of this video. So if, so if anyone who's watching this video has this particular uh, graphics card a hand and wants to try to push it on various cooling methods like custom water cooling dry ice, LN2, whatever, it's very handful if you can find all the necessary stuff for this card from the description box below. So the thing you need for overclocking, as this is a Kimpin series of graphics card, you don't need to do any kind of like uh, modifications like soldering, whatever. There have been easy to use cards even before this, even from EVGA and also from other vendors, but usually you had to do at least some kind of like hardware modification on the car to be able to push the voltages high enough without any trouble. Like for example with uh, like 7970 Matrix and TCU2 you usually had to short some pads together to get the card like high enough on the voltages etc. With the Kimpin you don't need anything but it's nearly necessary to obtain an EV bot if you want to push this card easily on LN2. Back in the day we didn't have classified.exe software yet for this card. I'm not fully sure if you could modify 
like a modern classified exe to support this card i don't know i think it could be possible but with the uh, methods that are available at the time of making this video you are pretty much limited to ev bo or using the elmore evc2 uh, overclocking utility for example i think you could use that one with this card i've only been using the ev bo tool which was uh, an overclocking tool they released already back in 2008 or 2009 for the x58 series of motherboards and it has been supported all up until today with uh, even the most latest graphics cards and also some motherboards with the most modern motherboards it's not supported anymore but it's still supported by the most latest graphics cards like 3090 Kimpin, 3090 Ti Kimpin, 2080 Ti Kimpin etc. But nowadays it's not really needed if you ask me. With the EVBO you can control all of the main voltages so the core, memory and PLL. You can control the overcurrent protections of those different voltage rails and also the switching frequencies. None of that will make any significant difference on air cooling. I already tested it myself. So if you only run this stock air cooling, you cannot pretty much get any gain from raising the voltages. Only a minor gain from the V-Core, but the 780 Ti GPU is a very temperature picky uh, GPU. So you can't really gain much from increasing the core voltage if you don't at least use custom water cooling on the GPU. But for sub-zero cooling it's necessary to be able to push the voltages and switching frequency is quite high and you will trigger OCP if you uh, don't disable it. Like for example when De Bauer ran this card on LN2 with tank carb during 2014 I think they had like constant load somewhere around 1200 watts and the highest peak with this very specific card model was over 2000 watts but that was of course a very short peak. So there aren't that many like features you need to take a look at if you want to push this card on LN2. We have the uh, BAUS switch over here so it's normal and LN2 right next to the power connectors. This one only has dual BAUS compared to the newest cards from EVGA which are usually triple BAUS I think. We have three power connectors over here so dual 8 pin plus a 6 pin. The 6 pin one is colored a little bit differently so it's actually uh, like uh, a supplementary uh, power connector which you don't necessarily need to plug in but I would at least recommend you to plug in. For LN2 you do need to uh, put a 6-pin power connector over here. We have over here we have the EV box connector at this side. Hold on it's a little bit hard to show but it's over here and then we have a few deep switches right over here, over here and over here. Uh, actually these are the uh, BAUS LEDs to indicate which BAUS you are running. So we have normal and LN2. The dip switches are over here and I don't remember from the get-go what they do but we'll, we should be able to see it once we take off the backplate and the cooler from this card. So let's take a brief look at the card itself and okay that's how the card looks like after the cooler has been disassembled. So you can easily see that the cooling plate for the memory chips and for the VRMs really stands out from this card. The good thing is what they made already back in the day was that they left the cooling plate separate. So we have a separate cooling plate for the memory chips and separate one for the MOSFETs. Usually on many cards of that era there was only like a single cooling plate for the entire card. Like for example on the 7970 Lightning from MSI I actually had to cut the uh, heatsink in half using an iron saw to be able to use a heatsink on the VRMs but to get the uh, uh, heatsink like away from the memory chips because it usually prevented me on using some custom cooling methods on the GPU like an LN2 container for example. On LN2 we need to have a cooling heatsink on the MOSFETs but we don't necessarily need a cooling plate for the memory chips because the memory chips will get adequate cooling from the frozen BCB when we run the GPU very cold and usually or sometimes it can be very worthwhile to have the memory chips running warmer than where the GPU is running at. So uh, we don't need this heatsink at all if we run this card on LN2 but we need to have the best possible cooling on the VRMs themselves, especially if we use gear that we have nowadays, for example the GPU 
Inferno backplate from Kimping Cooling. Even with that, we don't need extra or additional cooling on the memory chips, but we need to have adequate cooling on the VRMs because they will get very hot during bench. So uh, the best way to cool the MOSFETs is to use a heatsink like this with very high performance thermal pad in between and using a very strong air cooling fan pointed directly towards the heatsink, like a very strong delta cooling fan with very high CFM rating. But that's pretty much it. So the card is very easy to use and ready to be pushed on LN2. So you don't re really need anything. You don't need to do any kind of hardware, hardware modification for this card. You may only have to flash like uh, another BIOS for the card, but that's pretty much it. So you just need, you just need to insulate the card, take off the uh, memory cooling plate, put the container towards the GPU and you are pretty much good to go. So let's remove the cooling plates just like this get them out of the way and that's how the card looks like in a more closer loop pretty much so now it's probably easier to see the cool the power connector so we have two black PCI Express 8 pin power connectors over here and the supplementary 6 pin is colored like a little bit gray or how does it look like a bit I think it looks a bit gray the EV box connector then we have the probe it voltage measurement points over here just like on all the other EVGA components since then, like motherboards, graphics cards, etc. Like nowadays, every second pin should be a ground pin. So the first one should be GPU, then ground, then memory, then ground, then PLL, then ground, and then 3.3 volt input measurement, then ground, and the last one should be 12 volt input measurement and ground. Some uh, LEDs over here for the different voltages, so GPU, memory, PLL 3.3 and 12 volt. The BIOS switch over, is over there. SLI connectors are over here. I think it's pretty straightforward. And then I did check online what the different dip switches will do. So the two over here next to the BIOS switch connector, according to the info I found on evj.com, these are some uh, BIOS write protection uh, dip switches. So you need to enable both of these if you want to flash another BIOS to the card. I think it's only a safety precaution so that you don't accidentally corrupt the card by flashing like a, a bad BIOS or whatever. So that's pretty much it. And those two over there, they are pretty much the same as on the newer Kimping cards. So they only give like a tiny voltage pump, I think on the vehicle. So if you put the uh, pin, if you enable the pin number one, it will give a 25 millivolt bump on the voltage and the second one combined with the first one will give a 50 millivolt bump overall on the GPU voltage. So they aren't really needed. You only need the EV box connected and just use EVGA precision software or Afterburner Extreme from MSI, which you can find from hardware forums and you can use those two software for actually raising the clocks and uh, that's pretty much it. So you only set the voltages, switching frequencies and the OCP limitations using the EV bot overclocking uh, uh, tool like that. And then you just do the actual uh, clock speed adjustments inside the operating system with software. I will uh, put the link for all of the software down in the, down in the description box of this video, just like I said, it was quite difficult to find the correct EV Bob firmware for this card, as many of the original stuff is now gone from the internet. Like for example, the uh, original uh, Kimping Cooling forums are now gone, so you can't find all of the old uh, important inf information that was stored over there. But luckily, many things were saved on the hardware Bob forums, where you can find all all of the important stuff. Anyways, for cooling, it's easy to find like custom water cooling for this card because this have pretty much the same holes as GDX 580, GDX 480, even uh, not normal 780, 980, 980 Ti, etc. So uh, if you use the very old uh, original Tech9 Icon or Tech9 Fat, you can use the eight point mounting with this card, but it's kind of debated, does it really gain you anything? Now Kimpin actually sells a universal uh, 
mounting plate for the latest Tech 9 Icon Extreme, which does support this card as well, but it doesn't support the 8 point mounting, so you can just do the normal mounting holes if you want to use the Tech 9 Icon Extreme. And I, if I put this card on LN2 in the near future, I will definitely use the Tech 9 Icon Extreme because it's a very strong container. I did try this card very briefly on air cooling only. I didn't try it on custom water cooling and the maximum clock speed I managed to do was only like 1300 MHz on the core and memory I don't remember exactly, but uh, it's not the best what I've had with 780 Ti's at all, but it's not like completely crap either because the 780 Ti GPU is very temperature like picky GPU like I said, so you can't really gain anything from voltage adjustments if you don't get the GPU cooler. I think on custom water cooling, if the GPU was kept well below 40 degrees Celsius under load, the GPU should do at least maybe uh, close to 1400 MHz on the GPU. The best results I ever got from 780 Ti was with the 780 Ti Matrix, which did like 1450 to 1500 plus on custom water cooling when the GPU was kept well below 40 degrees Celsius. But as soon as the GPU goes very warm, like over 50 degrees or even 60 degrees Celsius, it becomes very unstable. So it's very hard to compare those two models that way. So the only like real answer will be how it will scale on LN2 and that will be for the next time. So uh, give me a thumbs up if you happen to own this card or if you are interested in this graphics card model or if you are planning to find one from the second hand market like eBay or forums, whatever. And uh, yeah, subscribe to my channel. Tell me what you think about this card and yeah, thanks for watching one of my videos once again, and I will see you on the next one.